So apologies. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi Welcome everyone on board. Um, I had not I had not unmute myself, so I was speaking and I nobody was listening. Anyways, uh, so actually the 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 the, the rationale behind this discussion to today is that uh, usually when we are reading any specific topic from a book, the unfortunately the domain is very limited, and we are just focusing on that specific disease. In the exam scenario, whether it is MCQ, written, viva, long case, table viva, whatever it is, the problem uh, comes that you are not able to, uh, uh, like you can say, add the overall uh, scenario which is being asked in the in the exam uh, uh, mode. Okay, so I will just try to give uh, with, with the example of a specific uh, one specific case, and we will continue our uh, this case case based discussion in the in the coming weeks inshallah okay uh, so so the the case which i am trying to discuss today is a pregnant patient will with the uh, mitral stenosis and pre uh, presenting for cesarean section okay so this is the base scenario and then if if we if we had time or if we am able to uh, add on so we can make it as a uh, bleeding uh, obstetric hemorrhage okay so i'm just giving you a basic thing that whenever whenever you are dealing with such uh, case or scenario what what should be your approach okay because you will uh, uh, not all the cases are available in in the common books and unfortunately the uh, if you don't practice uh, the common uh, scenarios which are being asked in the in the exams then you are not able to coordinate or integrate the things okay like if you have uh, this uh, this scenario only uh, you should be thinking about the pregnancy okay so all the physiological pharmacological and anatomical changes you should be knowing and whenever you are considering these changes you should be uh, uh, not re rather than just reading the lines lines of the the, the book Practically, uh, what should you know that uh, what is the change when it starts and when it's finished? This is point number one. The other, the second point is that how it affects the anesthesia management and how to tackle it, how to manage. Okay, so what, for example, if I just take one example, that uh, the the um, uh, the there is a pro pro coagulant state of pregnancy because of increase in coagulation factors. So the, the this is the change. The effect is that there are chances of uh, embolism. Okay, and uh, so uh, the, uh, so how to tackle it? you have to give the DVT prophylaxis. So just try to uh, enumerate or focus all the changes which occur in a pregnant patient in this way. Okay, that what is the change? What is the effect and how to manage? And when they start and when they finish. So this is one thing you should be focusing. And then of course, uh, there will be consideration for the baby. Not only throughout, like there will be certain uh, phases one will be the organogenesis and then like progression of the pregnancy and then delivery okay so all three uh, phases uh, you should be having in your mind so the, uh, this will be the second thing okay and then with reference to mitral valve mitral valve disease okay so there are certain points you should be knowing about it that whatever is the pathology. It may be mitral stenosis, it may be aortic stenosis, it may be peripartum cardiomyopathy. The things can be, the names can be different, but there are certain common things that you should be focusing whenever you have, have, have such scenario that how to evaluate the cardiovascular system. Okay. And you have to integrate the changes in pregnancy. So uh, the, the things will be uh, exaggerated. So whatever it, uh, uh, pathology is, the, th the, the effects will be exaggerated because of the uh, already present pregnant changes in any, any other patient, which will be uh, further um, making your anesthesia management and the 
condition of the patient more challenging. Okay. So you should be knowing that whenever you want to evaluate or see the cardiovascular system, there will be certain sign symptoms and then investigations. This is the basic the basic thing. Then, then how will you evaluate if specifically with reference to mitral valve disease uh, that, for example, what is the severity? If so, severity for two things, you will see the size of the valve and the pressure gradient. Okay. And the third thing will be the uh, regurgitated regurgit fraction. If it is uh, also uh, associated with regurgitation. The, these three things. The fourth thing will be now now think logically what will be the effect back. There will be stasis of blood. Okay. So the chambers will be dilated. Chamber dilatation. Mute yourself, please. Okay. So the, the effect of this stasis will be the formation of clot. So this will be one thing. And then if it is going back, now the pulmonary vasculature will be involved. So pulmonary vasculature will be leading to gradual, according to the duration of the disease, according to the severity of the disease. Initially, there will be two things which can occur. If there is acute problem, there will be pulmonary edema. Okay. And if it is a chronic one, so it will be leading to pulmonary hypertension. Okay. So if it is pulmonary hypertension, then the effect will be on the right side of heart. So Whenever you are evaluating, so you should be knowing the sequence of events which are occurring, starting from the, the disease pathology leading to changes in the chambers and then chambers leading to the... Uh, I humbly request all of you to please keep yourself mute. It's a big distraction for me and it's wasting time. Please take care yourself. You know, this is not good. Dr. Fayaz, I request you to keep yourself mute. Okay, so right side of heart uh, will be affected according to the disease severity. So whatever in uh, mode you are doing, you can uh, take some history. There will be chance uh, of uh, according to the status, there may be cough, there will be signs of overload or if there is heart failure, there will be involvement of left side of heart and there will be involvement of the right side of the heart. There may be edema uh, and all the things which you, you all know. Uh, you have to evaluate according to the, the, the things which should be in your mind that you have to see how much is the severity and how it is affecting the body. So, so this is the sequence of events. So if it is uh, not only this condition, the result of everything, whatever is going on, will be result in the form of heart failure or ischemia. Okay. So the result, ultimate result will be the, these two things. So this will be the, uh, the the sequence. So you have to uh, grade it that how severe the disease is. Okay. So this will be one one thing. Uh, then uh, uh, like you will, uh, then another important thing which you have to keep in consideration is with reference to anticoagulation. Okay. So anticoagulation, because if there is a, uh, like uh, uh, there will be one more scenario uh, in in addition to uh, this scenario which we are discussing is that there may be a mechanical help heart valve okay the the patient has al already underwent surgery so mechanical heart valve or tissue valve okay so uh, there are more complications with mechanical valve as compared to tissue valve but the consideration in this patient will be like there will be one thing, if you continue the warfarin or the uh, anticoagulation, there will be chances of bleeding versus if you stop it, so there will be chances of thrombosis. Okay. There are certain uh, guidelines you can see with American Heart Association or European Society guidelines. Okay. So generally it is said that always they do the risk versus benefit, but it is said that if warfarin is less than 5 milligram, you can continue. Okay. Uh, you can continue uh, because all the things will be according to the, the, the thrombosis risk. And this you will be keeping the, the cardiology on board and you will be taking advice from it. And of course, the, the patient family uh, should, be, should be aware of these things. 
okay so this is very important thing and another thing uh, like uh, the, with the same scenario whenever there is uh, have a valve, valve disease any anything can occur uh, uh, the result of ischemia how ischemia or failure can exhibit with uh, either in the form of uh, like st segment changes or uh, one thing which can occur is afib any arrhythmia but atrial fibrillation is a common and finding in patients with uh, mitral stenosis okay so this will be another because whatever question they will be asking you it will be revolving around uh, happening of these things which i have just tried to the, the, like uh, just give you a summary okay so you will be doing ecg you will be doing echo so what are the investigations so if you just move forward that we uh, we discussed about the uh, uh, about the signs, symptoms, okay? And now what will be the investigation which you will be doing in this patient just for the people who have joined late, a pregnant patient with mitral stenosis and for cesarean section, okay? So you, you are evaluating the patient on the basis of history, examination and investigation. So the relevant investigation will be in this case will be ECG, echo, okay? CBC, to see like hemoglobin, okay, or uh, like uh, uh, any uh, another important thing will be INR if the patient is on. Yes, yes, sir, yes, sir. I'm sorry. Yes, sir, sir. I, I cannot listen you clearly. Yes, sir, sir. Yes, chest X-ray. Okay, so chest X-ray. What 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 findings you can get with chest X ray? Sir, if there is only edema, we can uh, evaluate on that. Okay. Uh, on the hypertension. Yes, actually, uh, now we, again for chest X ray, again I will say <coughs> that you have to do risk uh, versus benefit. Okay. Uh, a number of findings which you can find with the x-ray now you can do it with echo okay if if for example your heart uh, this patient's heart function is good clinically the patient is good there will be not clear indication to do x-ray okay <clears throat> but anyways x-ray is one of the fine uh, thing you need to do then the coagulation studies again patient chest x-ray yeah, that's what I'm saying that it will depend on the, of course, if the patient is full term, actually x-ray can be done. But uh, what, the you know, whatever investigation you name, you have to prove what is the reason, what is the rationale. Okay. So this is uh, the, the, the important thing. You can, if you want to, if you, if you can prove that x-ray will change the management, Yes, echo definitely will be needed. Okay, the recent echo uh, will be needed uh, to see the, the severity of the disease. So it makes uh, a clear indication. <clears throat> uh, chest X ray, again, uh, as uh, mentioned in the chat box by one of our colleagues, that uh, it, it's you, you cannot say that it's unsafe, it's relatively uh, uh, like uh, you can say, according to the if it is the, the later half of the pregnancy, then. Actually, you can do chest X-ray if you if you see the the patient is in overload, okay. If it the patient is in heart failure, so are there any other things which you can do? Are cardiac enzymes, okay? So, with if you just see the like uh, uh, the cardiac failure markers, the BNF, uh, BNP, and ANP, okay. I don't have very good concept about them, but usually. These are the markers which they are using to see the severity of the heart failure. Okay. So, uh, you know, uh, Bardeep, your mic is very bad. So, unfortunately, nobody can hear you, you with this mic. So, either you change your mic or try to speak loud. Can you speak out what, what you want to say? LFT. Uh, I cannot, I cannot understand. You can write in the chat box. LFTs. Okay, LFTs. 
Okay, so how will you interpret LFTs? Uh, if only usually uh, there there is mild increase in enzymes. It it can occur in as a change of pregnancy. Uh, if for example there is a heart failure, then yes, LFTs can be uh, disturbed. So again, uh, I'm just trying to summarize. Again, we started from the changes in pregnancy. We discussed about how to, to see uh, the severity of disease with mitral stenosis. And uh, now we can just have few words about the cesarean section. Actually, cesarean uh, section, uh, another thing which they can ask you with this reference is that whether this patient can be for labor analgesia, uh, labor, labor epidural, okay? or the patient is going for cesarean section. So there are, again, the same things which we have discussed up till now, the same parameters uh, will be all, uh, in, under the consideration when you are planning <clears throat> which uh, anesthesia you can are giving sp spinal anesthesia or epidural anesthesia or GA, okay? Even, for example, you have uh, planned to the, <clears throat> I'm sorry, the disease is not severe, so you can consider spinal anesthesia or epidural. Can you give spinal or epidural in a patient with mitral stenosis? And mild cases. Yes, in mild cases. Again, I, I tell you something that you, this is, there is not a clear <laughs> answer. For because <laughs> epidural uh, I'm epidural. No. Sir, epidural can be given compared to spinal because uh, spinal causes vasodilatation and overload of e the heart. Epidural versus spinal. Okay. So, yes, sir. actually, whenever you are talking about central neuroaxial block, there are two things. One is the, the performance, okay, which can cause epidural hematoma with because of the the anticoagulation patient is taking one thing and the other thing is the hemodynamics okay so generally you have to maintain because the heart is uh, running on a narrow margin okay so you have to maintain the the svr you have to maintain the the after load and preload okay after load uh, because any you know i i want to clarify one thing in the books it is written you have to keep the svr high actually this is a very dangerous statement any examiner can catch you if he's thinking logically that if yes it is written in the in the book slow and tight okay and you don't think and you just uh, just reproduce what is written in the book but unfortunately if you are not able to the, the examiner can ask okay you will increase the svr the heart contractility is already limited or the reserve is already limited so if for example a heart is already failing for example okay so if you increase the svr is it good so better word, if you are speaking in, in, in viva oral part, it is better to say maintain SVR and don't let it fall. It's a better answer than saying increase the SVR. Okay. Similarly, yeah. sim similarly, if you say bradycardia, bradycardia is not what you want. You, you, you just say that maintain the heart rate and don't let it go high. Okay. So this is a better uh, answer than you are saying, I will increase the SVR, I will decrease the heart rate. The, you are saying the same thing, but the, 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 your uh, impression is totally different. Okay. So this is very important thing. Then maintenance of sinus rhythm. Okay. And so you maintain normal tension. No, remote, just that we will just come, come. I just let me say. So actually, the the word if you forget is the homeostatic condition. 
there is a little difference between if you remove this O and it you say hemo, so hemo is different. Hemo is for blood. Homeostatic condition is all which you uh, is a good anesthesia, oxygen, CO2, okay, uh, SVR, uh, but you can say preload, afterload, okay, pH, blood pressure, volume, what else? Okay, so the like Rhythm. acid. I'm sorry. Rhythm. Like, Rhythm. Yeah, no, no, this the rhythm will be the uh, the result. Yes, rhythm also, but uh, uh, like that's how you will be thinking that you have to maintain the oxygen, you have to maintain the CO2, you have to maintain the preload and afterload, you have to maintain the contractility, of course, rhythm and pH and blood pressure and volume. Okay, so if you forget this, these are the things which you have to maintain the nor even in any patient, but specifically, you will say. That because uh, if you will increase the heart rate, the diastolic filling, which is already creating a problem because of narrow mitral valve, it will be further decreased if you increase the heart rate. So the the uh, the patient will not be able to maintain the cardiac output. Okay, and in especially in pregnancy, there is already a little sort of uh, overloaded sort of state. Okay, and uh, there are changes in with reference to preload and afterload so uh, pre, uh, uh, so if you are not able to uh, make it keep them in balance the patient can go in decompensation okay so whenever you are answering this uh, sort of uh, like if they are asking how will you give anesthesia so coming back from from where we started that whether we can give spinal or epidural would be depending on the scenario not all patients are candidate to receive yes if you want to to th uh, the tell epidural as an analgesia rather than uh, sole mode okay so you can defend epidural that you if you are the patient is on bridging therapy and there is a gap in which inr is good platelet numbers are good so yes as a as a case of risk versus benefit you are uh, giving uh, epidural because that you can say now that you are avoiding sympathetic stimulation, okay? Because one thing we miss here is pain, pain relief, analgesia. Because pain is the biggest factor or pain or stress response. Response is a big factor, which will be leading to all the bad things, okay? All the vicious cycle will occur. And if you are able to have a good analgesia, you uh, the, the advantage will be that... Uh, uh, you will be able to uh, like uh, get so many good results that heart rate will be maintained. Okay, the the, the, the there will be not too much uh, load on the heart. Yes, uh, Pardeep. Sir, why we are thinking of spinal or regional anesthesia when it is uh, absolute contraindication of uh, vulvar heart disease? Why we are not going for GA? Uh, just uh, I, I I that's what I'm trying to tell you that actually what is the problem what happens how can you uh, how uh, what is the problem with spinal in mitral stenosis what happens actually sudden SVR change okay so the patient can uh, decompensate that's the reason am I right yes Pardeep yes sir absolutely okay. So, for example, now uh, in, in GA, what happens? If you have not given uh, GA in a proper way, only avoiding spinal uh, can, can give you a very safe anesthesia. Even in GA, what sort of care you need? You are absolutely right. Again, spinal, spinal is relatively contraindicated. So again, Relative. we have to maintain the goals. Like we have to maintain heart rate. We have to maintain and we SPR. We have to maintain the guy. So you will yeah, say so that in spinal, goals. in spinal anesthesia, it is difficult to achieve those goals, because if yes, you sir. give spinal in a patient which pa right. which which have uh, like uh, severe mitral stenosis, uh, patient will decompensate quickly, or patient can de decompensate quickly. Okay, 
So this, this is the thing. Yes. That's why spinal is not a safe option. So if you say, yes. then it will be difficult for you to to defend it. I'm not saying that you you will you will say spinal anesthesia, but uh, just to make you understand that why a spinal is not good is more important. Okay. So yes, Pardeep, uh, any any further clarification you need? No, no, sir. You were uh, making a scenario of spinal. That's why you uh, the, uh, trying to teach yes, us. Ke... Yes. yes, yes, yes. I'm just telling you, I'm not saying that you will give spinal. <laughs> spinal, you cannot defend spinal. Actually, it's very difficult. Uh, if you, Even if you, you say that it is safe uh, in certain scenarios, even if it is mild, uh, I, I will never say that you can, because it will be difficult to, to control the, the whole of the picture. Because okay. of some sign, sign and symptoms might, might, be, sir, might be masked, we uh, it is not necessary that we uh, get all sign and symptoms, even in mild. If it yes. is uh, hidden, no, hidden then actually, uh, we, will, we will be in danger. You are no, no. Actually, the thing is that in, in if it is uh, moderate to severe, <coughs> it's absolutely contraindicated. In mild, you just have to see that what is the indication why you ac ac actually want to give spinal. This is more important. Why, why you want to give spinal? Why you are not giving GA? Or you are why, if you want to give a, a good, good post-op analgesia, you can add GA with epidural. Okay? So, so some more things which are more important is the monitoring. Okay? Whether uh, if you are, even if you are trying to conduct uh, as a whole, uh, as a sole uh, anesthetic technique, epidural can be used if uh, possible or no. There is a concept of graded epidural, which can be used because in epidural you you can use some opioids. Yes or no? Yes, what sir. Are the what are the problem again? It can cross the placenta and it can cause respiratory depression, but it's not contraindicated, mind it, because you the you can just inform the even if you are giving GA, you can give, you can give opiates. If it is to, for the safety of the patient, you can give. It's not absolute contraindication to give opiates if you have a, a such scenario in which uh, uh, avoidance of opiates will create more problem to the mother. You have to think about the whole picture. Even if you have given opiates, the neonatologist, if you inform it, the neonatologist can manage it. Okay. And another uh, another uh, opioid which you can use is remifentanil because it will be rapidly metabolized and there is not much chances of uh, respiratory uh, depression. Okay. So with reference to monitoring, you will say that in addition to standard one and standard two monitoring, what you will be using, <clears throat> uh, standard two monitoring, uh, you will be using. But remember one thing, in this case, you have to say that you have to use arterial line, okay? Because arterial line uh, is very important. You have to uh, have the better control on the blood pressure, beat to, beat to beat blood pressure. And you can get a lot of information with reference to fluid status, contractility uh, In if you have arterial line, okay? The other thing is cardiac output monitor. If you have, Ma Pardeep, you have some other question? Sir, you uh, told one thing before respiratory depression. What was that? You was in placenta or something? Crossing the placenta. Crossing the placenta. Okay, sir. No. Okay. So cardiac output monitoring. Okay. Cardiac output monitoring. If you have, it will if it will give you all the uh, like uh, the status of the lungs, status of the the heart. Okay, and you can keep the SVR controlled. You can keep the volume status in a better, you can see. So if it is there, cardiac output monitoring is one of them. Then uh, urine output, okay, temperature. Temperature is a standard two or specialized monitor? Is temperature considered as standard two monitoring? Temperature is standard to monitoring. <clears throat> Anyways, so 
you that's how you will be uh, ecg uh, it is better if you if you can have five lead lights the five leads okay so uh, you uh, in the monitor it will be giving you a better so what else uh, only in in special case that if you are not we are discussing a case for cesarean section but everything is the same same mitral stenosis same pregnant patient the additional thing if you have a surgery in pregnancy will be uh, that you can you you have to say about fetal monitoring okay like i'm just giving you a hint that same same everything will be the same if you have a pregnant patient with valve heart uh, with the valvular heart disease for any other surgery okay so everything will be the same but fetal monitoring and counseling of the uh, the, 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 the 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 gynae ops people should be on board and uh, the extra thing will be ctg okay so th th this will be uh, you you have to tell about it okay now with reference to medications i did not uh, mention about the the airway but general generally you, you you as i mentioned that you opioids you can use if you, you, because otherwise there will be hmm. more stress response so you can use opioids in this scenario uh, if you have uh, opioids which are uh, not causing too much respiratory depression that will be better but otherwise you can give uh, so atomidate uh, there again, uh, bookish atomidate is being definitely being used. Uh, Pardeep, have you have some new question? You told about fetal monitoring CTG. Yes, I was right. Okay, so okay. Okay, so okay, so um, atomidate practically, um, if you are using uh, a technique in which uh, you are using a combination of medications, like for example, again this is my personal experience. This you cannot tell in the exam, but I'm telling you a practical. This is. For a few seconds, this is only practical. I am telling you that atomidate is not. I know I never use atomidate. I use a combination of medications in a way that actually the if you have arterial, yes, you will take arterial line before making the patient sleep. Okay, and then you can have a titrated control of the the medication which I will be telling you. But remember one thing: you cannot tell in the exam. This is I am just telling you a practical my own personal experience. Okay. So uh, a small dose of ketamine will give you a very good analgesia. And actually, the, I, I, I don't use opiates. I, I use ketamine in a way. Then give paracetamol. Okay. So you this you can give uh, like uh, uh, as a combination. So then, ketamine will not... If it not cause tachycardia, sir, heart rate... 20 milligram, not... 20, 20 milligram ketamine, give it to any patient. I can bet on yes. it, nothing will happen. Because it's not, a, it's a nothing dose. It's a very small dose, 20 to 25 milligram. is even less than 0.5 milligram per kg. Okay? It's a nothing dose. Yes. But it gives a very good... The, the, the There will be reduction yes. in the requirement of propofol. Significantly. Okay? Yes. Then, another... Uh, the, uh, use around 0.1 microgram per kg of Presidex. And what I do practically, I just put it in the paracetamol. So roughly you can say uh, that uh, around uh, around 10 mics uh, and around 10 mics I put it in paracetamol. So, so it, 0.1 max uh, dexmeditomidine. Yes, dexmeditomidine. I'm sorry. Dexmeditomidine. So you give yeah. IV direct or in uh, infusion? In that mics is nothing actually. Then mics you can give as a as a as a stat as well. But I give it in paracetamol. I put it in paracetamol, and as soon as it is going slowly, slowly. Uh, if 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 you need to to maintain the heart rate, then you need might need to give glycopyrrolate. But in this case, because you actually 
want to maintain the heart rate around 60 to 70. You don't yes. want tachycardia. So actually, whatever heart rate you receive, actually the, the advantage of giving Presidex that our heart rate will come down. Okay. Then another important thing is that uh, if you have rocuronium, uh, Sir, you put a uh, Dexmed, ketamine, uh, all in paracetamol, sir. Sorry? No, no, ketamine you can give uh, 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 directly, okay? Direct. But, but all in Dexmed in PCM. Yes, and, yes, and then uh, okay. the, the, the other thing will be that uh, uh, ketamine, Presidex, paracetamol, okay? And uh, actually, if you have rocuronium, it is better to give a higher dose. 1.2 milligram per kg. <clears throat> okay. And when uh, be very clear that rocuronium is a very painful injection. So give lidocaine. So lidocaine around, you can say less than 1 milligram, around 1 milligram per kg, around 50 to 60 milligram. And then you give rocuronium. Okay. And you can do a little, if you see, you can make a ramp position. Rapid airway management position. Just uh, keep the head side up. Okay. And then uh, pre-oxygenate. And uh, after giving this ketamine and Presidex, the, there will be patient will be a little, little sleepy. Okay. So while you are asking another thing, this is again, I'm telling you that la last few minutes, it's totally practical. I'm just telling you total practical tips. Even for example, if the patient is uh, now uh, not asleep just ask the patient to have deep breathing deep breathing okay the advantage ask the patient to deep breathe even without mask this will open up the alveoli which are closed make the patient head side a little up not uh, uh, like uh, exactly if you have a good table then you can make a relatively better position but the the aim is that it will increase the FRC, okay? Even, even without putting the mask, if you ask the patient, just have full maximum inhalation and exhalation. So the advantage will be that at least the alveoli, which are closed, in okay. uh, even in old age, you there is some atelectasis, okay? So the advantage of deep breathing may be when you have put the mask, patient is not taking that good, good breath. So actually, but uh, this is also... Again, I'm telling you, these are practical things that I ask the patient to have in like in Saudi Arabia, I say, Khud nafas amik, khud nafas amik. just take very deep breath. Okay. So the advantage is that the patient is the alveoli are open. Okay. Then actually, then you, then, then because if you have put the mask and the patient is not breathing deeply, it's useless. What advantage you are getting? Okay. So there is a lot of patients will have phobia from the mask. Okay. So the, there are so many advantages of giving this Presidex and ketamine or when, uh, right at the time when you are asking the patient or inducing the patient. And then what I do again, 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 I tell you that I, I go use my, uh, this is all experience. But if you have sevoflurane, if I ask you a question, sevoflurane versus propofol, sevoflurane versus propofol, which will have more effect on blood pressure? which will cause propofol. Okay, so what I use, I use sevoflurane at this time. Only for a few seconds. So the, again, the requirement of propofol will be significantly reduced. And this is my personal experience that if I'm using a relatively high dose of rocuronium and I'm using all these medications, in majority of patients, I'm not giving more than 50. Which if you are if you are not using this technique, you will definitely give 200, 150. And this will actually, you, you what you need at the time of induction is hypnosis, amnesia. You don't want the blood pressure to, to, to touch the heavens. You don't, you don't need to go too, too down. And the advantage of using sevoflurane versus propofol, that sevoflurane will make the patient sleep. And if you have given the muscle relaxant, in relatively high dose, the intubating conditions will be achieving early. And actually, you don't need to ventilate for a long time. Another thing, as I told you, this priming. Okay? So, you can give a, uh, some dose of rocuronium before you give 
uh, actual dose of propofol. But for rocodonium, there will be a little bit painful. So you can give lidocaine before it. You can start giving some ketamine and Presidex, paracetamol, as I told. This is my personal experience. This is, you don't tell this, this regime in the exam. They will definitely fail you. I can guarantee that if you will tell this in exam, they will definitely fail you. This is, I'm telling you, warning you even before. This is my total personal experience, but it is very, very effective because the heart rate, everything will remain very stable. Okay. And yes, here, if you, if you want to add fentanyl, you can add fentanyl if it is needed. Otherwise, in a majority of patients, I don't need it. Yes, another thing, another thing which I go not not specifically in this patient. Usually, I give morphine uh, if it is a long surgery or five hour surgery. I give I prefer to give morphine early so that by the time we intubate the patient and the 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 the, the stage of uh, incision uh, is achieved. Uh, already the morphine effect has come. So the giving, if you have morphine or even um, in, in like uh, whatever opioid you want to give, if it is uh, nalbufen, you know, again, I tell you, this is my personal experience. Usually don't put it for a long time before using. If you have just put it and give in few few minutes, uh, nothing happens. I have used it so many times, nothing happens. But again, it's it's not safe to put anything in uh, any preparation. And if it becomes there is some precipitation, it's better not to give. Or don't put it and keep it for a long time. Like I, I just put it when the paracetamol, the line is flushed, then I put it small dose. So within few minutes, I, and actually when I'm inducing the patient, I'm uh, aspirating with the syringe and even pushing it even faster. Okay. So this is, I'm just telling you a regime to manage this thing. So coming back to the scenario, in the exam point of view, you will use Domidate. You, you have to tell that you we will try to have a medication which is cardiac safe. This is all other is my personal experience. Okay. So um, we talked about monitoring. We just have to finish in next 10 minutes. I'm sorry. I took more time because this patient, there are a few more important things which I need to tell you. Uh, okay, so maintenance of the another one important thing is that you can ask the surgeon to give lidocaine along the line of incision before give the incision. Okay, this will also reduce the stress response. This is again a thing which is people are not using it, but I will suggest you to do it. Lidocaine along the line of incision before they they give the incision, and you can use this a request to any patient. There is no contraindication, actually, unless there is a, a, a allergy to lidocaine. This is a very good technique to use lidocaine, uh, not bupicane, because bupicane will take more time. Lidocaine will be quick. Yes, Pardeep? Sir, few questions, sir. Uh, actually, I have to. Yes. Uh, so can I because, ask now? Okay, now you have interrupted me, so ask quickly. Sir... You said that uh, we have to use uh, paracetamol. Uh, for it, we have to use half hour before but because it will take half an hour to be affected. Uh, not not really. Practically, it's very quick. Then even 10 minutes are enough. So another thing you told that we, you mixed paracetamol with Presidex. Will it, yes. will it not, not cause drug interaction? The, I have already answered the question. I have already answered the question. That this is, uh, I have not, I have told you before, this is my personal experience. Okay. Okay, sir. Don't put it, don't put it for a longer time. This is, don't okay, put it sir. for a longer time. It can cause problem. But practically, I have used it in so many patients, nothing happened. Okay. This is, I'm just sir, telling you my. Presidex and ketamine, can we use in this patient uh, with the fetus, pregnant with fetus? It can guard bradycardia and uh, sedate the patient uh, in the fetus. You know, actually, the thing is that how much dose I have asked you to give. It's only 10 mics. It's a nothing dose. It does not cause anything. Ketamine, 20 to 25 milligram. It's a nothing dose. It's a very low dose. Okay. Okay. So I will just try to, to finish uh, some of the points. So with reference to the, 
yes iv yes iv okay uh, uh, actually uh, with reference to toko 50 i i have just told you uh, samara i have just told 1 mg per kg okay sir Round thanks lidocaine you can give iv as well as ask them to give uh, at the place of incision okay lidocaine along the line of incision if you are uh, infiltrating when they give the incision, there will there will be a very good effect. Yes, Pradeep. Yes, please. So you told that twenty to thirty milligrams. Sir, if it is a five to ten year old boy, then sir, I am exactly um, want no, to no, know you the will dose. Of course, no, no. It is it is it is around point three milligram. If you are asking about the dose, it's a very low dose. Okay. Okay, you, okay, according the, if you are if i'm telling you 20 in an adult you will make <clears> it 10 in a, a, a lesser weight okay so few points about the uh, the uterotonics so if you are using oxytocin it it can cause tachycardia so either you have to avoid it or you have to give very slowly or you have to give an infusion okay up to 5 units but ask them that it if if they can avoid it it's better uh, then uh, the what about uh, this one um, the other uh, prostaglandin egf2 alpha or ergot okay or mesoprostol they all have uh, effect on the svr and uh, uh, this one so you have to be very careful but uh, there is one medication it's available here at least in saudi arabia it's carbitocin okay okay carbitocin so carbitocin is actually uh, much uh, safer uh, than oxytocin. It, is, it does not cause significant tachycardia. Okay, so uh, you just uh, you you can just use this. And, and again, the same care which you have done at the time of induction, you have to do it at the time of recovery. Okay, this patient ideally should be going to to ICU uh, or HDU for post-op uh, hemodynamic monitoring. Okay, so these are the things. Yes, Pradeep? That's what I asked before. Okay, so so um, like uh, uh, with reference to because uh, I, I took much more time than I was expecting actually. This, this part took a lot of time. So just as a summary, if you have a case like this, you have to correlate the things. So in this scenario, which we discussed, we discussed about pregnant cha pregnancy changes. So you should be making a list and actually pregnancy is one of the thing which is in every exam, there is no exam which will be finished without <coughs> having a scenario of a pregnant patient. So please, my suggestion to you, make a, a chart like that, that when the, the, the change start, when it finish, what is the change? What is the effect of an anesthesia management and how to, how to manage it? Okay. So uh, you should be knowing all these changes. Then we discuss about mitral stenosis or any other cardiac problem. Uh, how to see, we, we will see some history, examination, investigation, see the severity, be mentally prepared for it, IC arrangement, and then uh, like uh, invasive monitoring, use uh, of uh, epidural versus uh, spinal versus GA. What are the things, which what are the goals? Homeostatic conditions, maintenance of homeostatic condition is very important. Maintain, hy uh, avoid hypoxia, avoid hypergarbia or hypogarbia, avoid acidosis, maintain sinus rhythm, maintain preload, maintain afterload, maintain contractility, avoid any medications which are causing uh, sudden change. Uh, we have to give uh, dexmedinone paracetamol and captain before profile. And, uh, yes, th th this is my personal experience. Try it carefully. Okay, don't tell in the exam. I'm telling you again, don't tell this 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 thing in the exam because this is not uh, actually this is called as a cocktail. Okay, of or mixed fruit, but unfortunately, it needs more much more studies to be done before we can put it graded epidural. Yes, uh, I can I can actually graded epidural is that. Uh, you are not giving a bolus dose uh, immediately and you are trying you uh, you you are trying to give in in a yeah like uh, in a way that the effect is coming slowly and gradually and then you are monitoring with the with the changes 
okay like you have taped that taken the arterial line you have uh, taken uh, like you are monitoring the level then when the level is being achieved then you will start the surgery so graded epidural is that you 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 are not giving a bolus dose very fast you are giving slowly 5 5 5 ml 5 ml dose and then you are making a combination with opioid uh, so that's it okay so uh, so another message which i wanted uh, to all of you that whenever you are studying okay when you are whenever you are studying try to integrate the things like you see how many questions we created while our, while we are discussing and these questions you will not find the answers the clear answer you will not find in one book so just again i request you to have multiple source reading multiple resources uh, i will just show you if i was i was just uh, finding some of the things like uh, I, these these are the evidence with reference to use of um, uh, warfarin during the the pregnancy uh, you see this is one of the source because uh, it, in some books you will find that warfarin is contraindicated in in pregnancy so it's not like that you have to do risk versus benefit and some of the studies say that less than 5 mg can be can be given of course there will be chances of uh, teratogenicity mm -hmm. but if there are chances of blockage then a patient will definitely die if you stop uh, warfarin uh, and you are not able to control the because bridging therapy is not for months bridging cannot be for for uh, months it is for a shorter duration of time in the perioperative period it's not giving as good anticoagulation as uh, compared to warfarin okay so again um, like uh, inshallah we will have some more case discussions in the coming maybe after ramadan we i will try to have uh, uh, more of them a, a number of discussions i have already done and they are available in the youtube channel which is not a monetized channel okay so few of the links i will request all of you to have a look on these these are the the, the year wise i have arranged all the articles you will find the latest articles up to up to, to uh, march 2024 everything is there okay <laughs> So this is one of the link and the, the other link is uh, having all the books and I will just show it to you before I finish. Uh, in, this, in this link, actually, I have arranged year wise, sorry, topic wise. Unfortunately, I am not able to arrange the last few years. I'm not able to maintain this topic wise because it has all the topics arranged. Okay. So, unfortunately, I'm not able to maintain it because I, it's all meant, done by me. But I request you to open these article, uh, links and see at least one or two times so that you know where are different uh, things are available. Okay. So, these has topic-wise uh, articles. In this link, uh, we have some different sort, sort of books. Uh, in this in this uh, folder this there are a lot of questions which i have made for a number of scenarios not all the topics are covered and uh, sometimes i if anyone wants to have uh, like any questions you can find here and i i'm not able to to make more question in in, uh, in in last few years i don't get that much time but there you will find a lot of good things here uh, this is a very important thing if i if you people have a lick here how to approach any patient this is a very important file if you open it even you can add on to it that how you should target any case or any scenario or any like daily if you practice this thing in the war in the or uh, i can guarantee you this will make your an approach for anesthesia very easy and very uh, meticulous okay so some some words about preoperative preoperative testing, and this is some viva scenarios. And actually, these are it should be changed misnomer as viva scenarios. If you just practice them, believe me, these this is the best source for your uh, practice. Even if you are studying, I can just you can have a look here, and in every word you will you can uh, explore further. Okay. That like in the elderly woman for laparotomy perforated bowel with large neck swelling, presumed goiter, 
maybe we will i will just try to have these cases discussed and because in one case you will discuss so many things okay and this is beyond the scope of one book do we need to stop for ferrin five days before is there any chance of thrombosis while yes always there will be chance of uh, so always we have to do risk versus benefit okay okay so i yes yes pradeep you want to ask something pradeep so i asked in chat box sir just a second Grade A epidural will take how much? Actually, uh, uh, don't tell anyone. Uh, I I don't like epidurals. I don't. I I I have all almost deleted from my practice. Labor analgesia, of course, I'm not doing it as uh, when you become consultant, you get less chance of doing uh, emergencies. Okay. So in elective cases, there are because in laparoscopic surgery there is no need of epidurals now. And even in laparotomies, I have used erector spiny block. I'm not very perfect in putting the, the catheters, but I have seen that if you have um, like uh, erector spiny block is a wonderful block. I have used it for a number of midline surgeries uh, above uh, between like uh, Zephy sternum to uh, like umbilicus. Okay, it cover it, it gives a very good uh, analgesia. And actually, epidurals, they, because, you know, we in, in a number of places, you have to take care of the logistics as well. If you don't have a very good post-op care, in, 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 uh, like sometimes it's not safe to give uh, epidurals because the, the post-operatively, if any complication occur, this will be on your name. So I hardly give, use epidural now. <laughs> Though you will, don't, don't kill me for this word. Okay. Yes, please. Any other question, Pardeep? But of course, I'm not saying that we cannot use it because, you know, the scope is decreasing for, uh, for, for example, total hip or total knee. They are, we are using blocks, uh, reactor canal, uh, go block post-operatively and intra-articular uh, use of uh, a combination of medications. They are using NSAID, uh, uh, steroid, and um, uh, uh, bupicane they inject while closing so inside that joint it is giving a very good uh, analgesia and they want to have iras enhanced recovery after surgery so they are trying to reduce the use of epidurals even majority of the surgeries uh, they are being done laparoscopically in laparoscopic surgery you don't need epidurals actually there is no need for epidurals in laparoscopic surgery if you are you for if you are talking about uh, cesarean section even cesarean section uh, uh, you can get a very good analgesia with tab block why to put an epidural okay so this is again yes there are certain things which are very effective if you have given spinal if you have the availability of intrathecal morphine intrathecal morphine is much more effective than even pca morphine of course not everything is available in every part of world okay but uh, you open your vision. You, even you don't have the facilities for a number of medications. Believe me, I tell you that at least you should know what you are doing. Okay. And don't follow something without your personal experience because a number of things are written. Intrathecal morphine dose, uh, Pardeep, around 100 mics to 200 mics, 0.1 milligram to 0.2 milligram maximum. Okay. Okay. So thanks a lot, all of you. And any other further question, you can contact me anytime on WhatsApp. Uh, anyone wants to join our group is welcome. Uh, you can uh, just uh, message me on my WhatsApp number anytime. I'm available to, okay. So thanks a lot. And, and another thing, if you want to discuss any of cases, just let me know. I will, uh, yes, of course, conducting these classes uh, needs much more time and energy. And another thing that um, sometimes if I, for example, if I ask myself to prepare a very beautiful presentation, maybe I will never do it because I, do, I don't have time to make a very beautiful, attractive presentation. So pardon me for being a little messy because I'm not very good in using the stylus on the screen. 
but I try to explain the things rather than just showing you a slides and slides and slides. It's useless. If, if you don't have, because so many counter arguments uh, you can create. Okay. I have tried to answer as many questions and even if someone is have some more question, you all are welcome. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Assalamu alaikum.